Okay, so I'm going to try and make this recording as quick as possible because I have very slow internet and uh, I'm going to have to probably reduce the quality of this video to be able to upload it from home anyway. I'm not going to be at school tomorrow, so you're going to miss out on period zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a quick summary of the, the chapter and talk about some different points. Just to give you a bro uh, an overview, I'm going to talk a little bit about forming processes, which is in this window here. Uh, this is on These videos are all on uh, Facebook and uh, if you're watching this in the future hopefully that will be on my own website but that's not yet um, this is the chapter these relate to the chapter review questions at the end of the chapter I'll come back to that but just in case I don't forget again that should be on Facebook or hopefully one day a website and what I'm going to go through is I'm going to so one of the things I really want to focus on in this video is talking about uh, polymers okay so here's what I'm going to do just to give you a recap of the things that we have done so far I'm going to go at pretty fast speed here so with historical developments I would suggest you probably want to know two or so uh, historical developments we discussed a lot in class you wrote down detailed um, explanation of one of them the effect on engineering in people's lives, we're going to talk about this more and more. Uh, this is something we keep referring to. Um, I love the uh, couple of Star Wars references we have here about feeling the force, but we're going to move on. So we've learned about SI units. I've given you a whole set of things called units of measurement, and we watch the uh, Eureka videos that explain that. By this stage, I think most people are familiar with giga and mega and kilo and milli. And uh, I've said that in this subject, you will need to, you won't need to know calculus, you won't need to know any real advanced maths. You'll need to know basic algebra and trigonometry. As long as you can do those things, you'll be okay. Now, what I usually set, and I may end up sending today, is um, just a set of trigonometry questions, just to you to, for you to practice. We're not going to do vector addition in the week seven test, or at least in 2019, we're not going to. So um, don't need to worry about applying any maths really in this test, which is not great because it's not a good indication of what this course will you know, require you to do. Not hard maths, but a lot of maths. Um, okay, so in terms of scalars and vectors, I would just say that we need to know that a vector has magnitude and direction. Oh yeah. Um, I watched Alita this week, and um, in Alita there's also a character called Victor, but I don't know if he's cooler or less cool than uh, the one in Desp Despicable Me. Okay, we talked about Newton's th three laws. Law one can be summed up by the word inertia. Law two can be summed up by F equals MA. Law three is the one that everyone knows. Every action is an equal and opposite reaction. You need to understand the concepts of mass, force, gravity, weight. You probably need to be able to um, give a definition of those, right? I haven't written the test yet, but that's the sort of thing you want, might want to know. Weight is just another force, so where force equals MA, weight equals mass times gravity, gravity being the acceleration. Um, Gravity on Earth is 9.8, where it, we can get away with using um, 10 meters per second per second. Okay, simple machines. Where really, there are only two simple machines, the lever and the inclined plane. Screws are just a kind of inclined plane. Um, wheel, wheels, axles, uh, also I should put out axe heads um, and cutting, cutting blades are inclined planes. Wheel and axles. Uh, levers, pulleys, well, they could be another class. If you go to Wikipedia, they'll say it's another class. I'm not going to do that in this video because I'm worried about time. But I would class them if I had to in the uh, lever category. Some Wikipedia classes them separately. Gears, I definitely would put in uh, levers. They're just continuous levers. Chain drives are very similar to gears. Um, we just have a look here. So we have a belt drive or something like that. So when I worked in the limestone mine, uh, I had to change a lot of conveyor belts. That was one of my main jobs. Okay, classification materials. I talk about, okay, first of all, at the atomic level, we need to know that there, everything is made of atoms. There are about 90 to 120 elements. Um, the elements are the different class classifications. Everything's made of Lego blocks. There's only 90 or so, 90 to 100 different Lego blocks that everything is made out of. Uh, these are the elements. Um, now we have compounds and solutions. We've talked about how that's a little bit of a murky gray area is what the different distinction is there. Solutions are what we talk about with alloys. Um, if you have a look on my uh, the picture that has the picture of Dalton and Democritus, everything is made of atoms. At the end of that, I talk about uh, solutions. There, we are interested in interstitial solutions and um, substitutional solutions. 
uh, you should know an example of each. For compounds, compounds are um, combinations of elements in a fixed ratio. NaCl is salt, H2O is water. We're going to talk more about those in a second. Um, and mixtures are any um, any combination of pure substances, either elements or compounds, in a mixed uh, in a non-specific non ratio. Okay, so the reality is that we classify um, all materials as either metals or non-metals. When we talk about metals, we're going to talk more about this in a second. Metals can be grouped into ferrous and non-ferrous. We have ceramics. Um, okay, so within all other materials, we can classify materials in four groups. We talk about metals, and then we have ceramics, polymers, and composites. This book says biological, but all biological materials are composite materials. Now, this is something I want to talk about for today's lesson. You need to know about the properties of materials. This is what I'm going to be focusing on for you to look up, is you need to be able to define strength, hardness, elasticity, and plasticity. I would say they're the good ones to know. I would also suggest that one, something I said for homework is durability. Now, um, these already have their own definitions. I will discuss this again when I see you next, but you should have be comfortable that you can provide a um, definition. I always like to point out that here, stress is the ability to withstand stresses, not loads. It's a minor, uh, minor distinction between uh, Copeland and I, but uh, I think it's worth making. Hardness is the ability to resist scratching and indentation, but I would also say it's the ability to hold a sharpened edge. Um, toughness is a bit more of an interesting idea. We also talk about things like brittleness. Uh, so just in case I, uh, you know, use some, I try not to use things that are not on the list. But um, toughness and brittleness are measurements of how easily something shatters or something, how easily something breaks. Chemical properties, we just talk about corrosion, maybe UV resistance, not really relevant. Physical properties, I would suggest you don't need to worry about. Thermal properties, I think, are fairly obvious. You should know that um, most materials, ice being the, uh, the exception, uh, they expand when they get hot and they contract when they get cold. This is a real issue for engineers, but not something we talk about too much. You just need to know that, that fundamental concept. You need to know that metals conduct electricity. Everything else pretty much doesn't. Um, Again, water being a, an interesting exception. You need to know about magnetism. There are pretty much, you need to know that nick, things with iron or nickel or cobalt are the only real things that really um, are magnetic. If you someone reminds me, I might put up a video on why things are magnetic, not really too critical for this course. Okay, so for the basic chemistry that we need to know, this is really this and, and corrosion are the only two real chemistry concepts we need to know. We need, um, in this course. So we need to know that everything is made of atoms and atoms are made of three subatomic particles. That's not really the whole story. I have posted a link from Kirkazak that goes into much more detail, but you don't need to worry about that. You need to know that there's neutrons, protons, and that they live in the center of the atom. You need to know protons have a positive charge. You need to know electrons orbit around the, pro the nucleus in what we call shells and that they have a negative charge. That's pretty much what you need to know. There are three states of matter, at least as far as we're concerned, solids, liquids, and gases. You need to know that um, as the atomic energy, the amount of energy in an object uh, increases, the more likely they are to be a gas, the more likely they are to... Uh, so solids hold their shape, liquids slide over each other and take the shape of their container, whereas um, gases fill up the entire... The liquids hold the base of the container and gases hold the entire shape of the container. Okay, we need to know about um, valencies and we need to know about valence electrons and as part of bonding. We have ionic bonding. So ionic bonding is where the... So everyone wants to, to have a complete outer shell. So you need to know that lithium wants to lose an electron and fluorine in this case wants to gain an electron. In the case of salt, the sodium wants to lose an electron, the chlorine wants to gain an electron. When they do that, they both become stable ions and they now have a charge. The one that loses an electron is now positively charged, the one that gains an electron is negatively charged. They're then held in place, in place by an electro, um, electromagnetic force. They, um, this bond is very strong but if it's dislodged, it will shatter. So it's brittle, so strong but brittle. And this is usually the case of ceramics. We also have covalent bonds. Covalent bonds, the electrons are shared between the cells. This is the case for polymers um, and other materials such as uh, oxygen, so O2 molecules or water molecules, um, or sugar molecules are also follow this, this pattern. Thirdly, so we need to know three different kinds of bonds. I'm just gonna outline them again, ionic, covalent, 
and metallic bonds. So metallic bonds, we've talked about ions earlier. So we talked about how sodium or uh, was this what, lithium, they become, um, if they lose their outer electron, they become a positively charged ion. In this case, they're not giving the electron away to an, a, another um, element. Instead, what they're doing is they're all collectively sharing that electron. The phrase that we want to use is that um, metallic bonds consist of positive ions surrounded by a dislocated or um, a, a sea of electrons. Um, so what do they call here? A sea or cloud of electrons. That's the sort of phrase um, that you use. I, I would be happy with, yeah, okay, I'm going to move on. So between, if we have um, water molecules, so H2O mo molecules or whatever this is, methane molecules, those methane molecules, they will still attract and repel each other. And that the between those other um, methane molecules, we call them London forces or Van der Waals forces. They're fairly weak, um, but they not something we talk about too much. But it is something to consider. Okay, next we need to talk about crystal structure. So most solids, not all, um, are held together in crystals. The big exception is glass, is um, an amorphous solid. It doesn't have a crystal, and some polymers. I have posted a link to the picture of Ariel where um, I talk about the polymers which are, don't have a crystal structure or only have a slight crystal structure. You don't need to know that. I would just say glass would be the only example that I would want to know. Now, um, many, uh, so there are two main crystal structures we need to know, which is body-centered cubic and face-centered cubic. You need to be familiar with those. I would all, I personally want to be able to recognize a picture of them. There's lots of different ways of representing that. Um, it's also interesting to note that some materials, for instance, steel, can be both an FCC, sorry, FCC and a BCC. That's called um, polymorphous. Right, so we need to know amorphous and polymorphous. This is crystals. This is the way that the um, ions, in this case, in, in the case of metals, line up or the atoms in, line up. Okay, so as we go into the details, we talked about things can be classified as metals, uh, ceramics, composites, or polymers. Uh, at least the engineering materials we typically use. There may be a few exceptions, but that, that, that will get us through our course. Okay, so. The metals can be really classified as either ferrous metals, which means that they consist mostly of iron, the main one being steel, and the main steel being mild steel, which um, that's the, the main one, ferrous metals and non-ferrous metals. So the main ferrous metal is mild steel. It has a third of a percent or 0.3% carbon. So it is a interstitial solution, which means that it's mostly iron and we just squeeze in a little bit of carbon here and there. Um, and that's an interstitial solution. Uh, now, there are other ones we need to know about. We need to know about higher carbon contents, which we call cast iron, and we need to know about stainless steels. But for the moment, we, we will cover those as separate videos in um, term three, so we don't need to worry about those for the moment. Okay, for non-ferrous metals, I would say that there's really two fa families that we worry about in engineering. We need to know about copper, and we need to know about aluminium. Of the copper, there's two that we need to know, brass and bronze. So. I like to say, to go in his, um, historical timelines, bronze is old, it contains tin. Uh, it's good to be, it's e easy to cast, and um, it is relatively brittle. On the other hand, brass is new, it contains zinc, and it is malleable and corrosive resistant. That would be enough for me. In terms of aluminium, uh, there is aluminium bronzes, we're not gonna worry about those. Uh, aluminium is has very good corrosion resistance. Uh, that would be and very lightweight. That would be probably the details I would want to know. Okay, so this is what I want to focus on for today, which is the second thing I want to focus on. The first one being the mechanical properties, and then the second one being casting, uh, forming processes. So if we have a look at forming processes, so fabrication consists of forming, casting, joining. There's also cutting and working, but we will worry about those in a second. Uh, these are the main three that you want to know about. Okay, so within forming, forming to make, to shape, we have forging, rolling, drawing, and extrusion. Now, that's not all of them, but that will get us a, a pretty good part of the way. So if I just make that over here, okay. So rolling is the first one. You want to know one example of rolling, and I would suggest if you watch this video here, they make, they roll, 
steel sections that are used for railway so um, railway links and you can see these wheels if you watch that video you can see the process a little bit more detail but for the moment you get the idea that you can see that that, sh that steel beam is sh being shaped into the shape of a, a, um, a railway length okay so that's rolling the next one is there is hot and cold rolling we'll go into that more detail next year or at least at the end of this year we go through we discuss rolling again but for the moment that's pretty much all I would want to know just one example and uh, railways would be the main one I'd use the next one that they talk about here is extruding so the example I would use if I wanted to know one example is extruding aluminium window frames that would be the example I would look at. So extrusion is the same concept as just pushing a duplo, just one second. Play-Doh is what I'm looking for. Okay. So that shape there of Plato being extruded same concept as Plato being extruded but um, in this case we're using aluminium anyway so that's a video that you can uh, watch in your own time okay so the next one so they've just got oh casting I missed casting okay I didn't see it in the book okay so casting so here's a video that shows casting. This guy has done lots and lots of videos on casting, um, like a hundred. Uh, I thought number 17 was a good one, that it, it was quite clear and you could see what he's done. Um, some schools do casting. It's not really the sort of thing that I go for because I like to teach theory, but um, who knows, you might be lucky. Um, but if you wanted an example of casting, this here is an engine block being cast and that's because it has um, interior sections that we just simply couldn't reliably machine at least not yet uh, so it's a fairly long video but I haven't uh, I know I did have a time stamp but it hasn't seemed to have gone to that time stamp so yeah about here is about right so we can see that that's the, the mold and then it's going to be cast into that shape. I'll leave that for you to watch. Okay, so they're the three that I would worry about. Um, worth mentioning as well, just as a, a point, so that I don't don't forget it. We will come back. To, we will definitely discuss it later. Damn, I lost it again. Is forging and um, forging, and the example I have there is wrenches, and uh, or spanners is what we tend to call them in Australia. And if you have a look here, that's a video of some spanners being forged. Forging can be described as just hitting things really hard. You can, uh, often you heat it up first to soften it, but then you just hit it really hard and it just forms it into that shape. Okay, um, so. Okay, the next thing we have is welding, and um, which is a joining method. There is also cold joining, so we can you know use rivets or um, we can use rivets or bolts to join things. But typically, what we're interested in is I'm just trying to find my. Bear with me for a second. <sighs> okay. Look, if I need to know about welding, I would want to know about the four main kinds of welding, oxy, stick, MIG, and TIG. Uh, if you look at the comments here, and we've gone through these in notes, I have videos um, or videos or pictures showing this. If you really wanted more details on welding, um, this guy here has a fairly interesting video. I think it goes for like five minutes uh, talking about the different kinds of welding. Um, the other methods, the soldering, soft, uh, soft solder, silver solder, and brazing, they're all interesting. Uh, when we get to the HSC level, you will have to be able to draw this diagram of um, the grain structure of welds. We haven't talked about grain structures, so it's not really worthwhile me talking about it yet. Okay, so here we see soft soldering, silver soldering, brazing, and silver soldering. They're grouped together. And then we have mechanical joining. So this is where we talk about cold joining bolts, nuts, screws, studs, rivets. Okay, so cutting methods is fairly obvious. We use things like hacksaws or um, 
shears, uh, so we, we, pneumatic shears or hand-driven shears, we can use grinding wheels, um, a whole bunch of other different methods. But something worth mentioning is we can also oxy cut. We can do the same oxy um, oxy torch we have here. We can also cut steel with a, um, a, a welding equipment. Okay, so moving back. Next we have fabricating. So this is um, fabricating, if we see that previous picture, Fabrication includes casting, forming, uh, joining, and cutting. Uh, it doesn't have cutting there, and cutting and shaping. But so in part of the fabricating, I guess they're counting the things that aren't part of those, those three there. We have turning, grinding, sawing, um, drilling, boring, reaming. Look, I, I'm probably never going to ask a question on those. I can't control what will be in the HSC. I su suggest you read it, but it's not something I would worry about. Okay, so now I'm going to get to polymers. So in the case of polymers, now this is the third thing that I think is worthwhile that you read through and go through in some detail. So if I go through the dot points here, we have the formation of polymers. There's two ways that polymers form. What we have either is either addition polymerization or condensation polymerization. Now in the case of uh, addition polymerization is we just take a chain, chink, 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 uh, yeah. And we join it. So in this case here, we have um, this is ethylene becoming polyethylene. So if we have ethylene, looks like this. It's a carbon compound with two carbons. There's a double bond here, so that those two carbons are sharing electrons. These these uh, lines represent the sharing of electrons. And in the case of ethylene, we have two carbons and four hydrogens. When we make a chain, what happens is that that double bond gets broken and becomes a long chain of carbon compounds. It's a very simple example. Now, so a polymer is a long chain of carbon compounds called monomers. The monomers don't have to be the same. So in this case we have a monomer. The on monomer is ethylene um, and then becomes polyethylene. Poly meaning many, Greek word for many. So what we have is just that chain gets joined along its length. Now if we have a look at the next one, we have a chlorine. Um, what does it become? Uh, what does it become? Can't find the name. Chlorine acetate. I mean, I, I don't know why they picked such an un uncommonly used um, monomer. I'm going to show you over here the one I like to use when we talk about copolymers. The idea that the polymers don't have to be this. The monomers don't have to be the same. ABS is a polymer. This is the one I always go to. It's a very commonly used one. It's used in Lego. Um, Chances are you've either played with Lego when you were young or you've had a friend who did. The plastic construction sets are one city, however, is a very high plastic for what's Lego. Their business motto is pretty simple. They buy plastic for one dollar and sell it for 75. Okay, so if we look at Lego, Lego has three different polymers. We have acrylon, trial, butadiene, and styrene. When we add those three things together, we get a long chain of combining those three. I'll just hopefully see if I can find a molecular picture of that. Okay, so that would be what it looks like and that would just repeat over and over again when they combine. So it looks fairly complicated here and um, so that's what they look like if we use the um, the building block method of representing uh, so that's another way of representing it. This is just a simplification. So I, I did talk about in class that we don't have to show carbon and all the hydrogens, and this is a way we can simplify that. Um, atomic structure is what we want to look at. It would be nice to see the whole thing is, I guess that there would be is a representation of the atomic structure, and that one there. Anyway, so that's the, the triple monomer, you might call it. So A, B, and C in this case of the polymer. So if we go back to the book, we can see here we have A, B, A, B, we get A, B, A, B. They don't have to necessarily go in that order. Sometimes they go in random orders. We don't need to worry. So 
This is all called addition polymerization. Just we simply what we get in is what we get out. We also have condensation polymerization, which is where we add two different um, monomers, and what we produce is not exactly the same. Usually, typically, what we have getting added at, um, result added in addition is water. That's why it's called condensation polymerization. So in this case, we have A A B. We have phenyl phenyl formaldehyde and that produces phenyl formaldehyde plus water. That's, that's condensation polymerization. Um, it's not something I'd really go into in too much detail, but it's worth mentioning. Um, it's worth knowing one example, phenyl formaldehyde, Bakelite is a very old plastic, um, a very historically significant um, plastic. Uh, not anymore, but originally um, billiard balls were made out of Bakelite. Okay, and hundreds and hundreds of other things, but billiard balls are the example I use in uh, my cards. Okay, so with polymers, polymers can either be a thermoplastic or a, um, so also known as a thermosoftening polymer, or they can be thermosetting polymers. What that means is that if we, um, if I take a um, drink bottle and I fill it up with boiling hot water, depending on the properties of the material, I might get that plastic might start to melt or to soften under the, the plastic. Whereas other polymers, so for instance the Bakelite, the phenyl formaldehyde, they just burn, they don't melt. So the reason for that is that when we have these chains, so this is the AAAAA chain, we can sometimes have cross-linking between those chains. So the example that I used in class is vulcanization so, of rubber and Damn it. Okay, so here we have a chain of rubber and another chain of rubber, and they're being held together by these um, triple sulfurs. So that gives us cross linking, and so that makes it go from being a thermo softening polymer, in this case an elastomer, to a thermo setting polymer, which means it no longer um, softens under heat, it now just burns. Uh, but it's much stronger, much more durable. Uh, durability being the ability to withstand um, corrosion, degradation, and um, to, to, um, to the elements and, um, bio, and not biodegrade. Okay, um, what am I looking for? I'm looking for the book. Okay, so some polymers that are worth knowing. Uh, if I go quickly to our book again, uh, sorry, my notes again. Okay, so the ones that you need to know, the numbered ones. Number one is the thing that makes up drink bottles. Number two is bottle caps and various other things. Number three is um, PVC is just basically, it, it, I'm going to say light switches and conduits and pipes. Number four is shrink wrap. Number five, polypropylene, used in lots of things, um, but it's very um, fatigue resistant, so it can be used in lunch boxes with a natural hinge. Uh, it's used in the chairs, the blue chairs that we have at school, um, but lunch boxes are a really good example because of that natural hinge. Things like ketchup bottles, things that need to be squeezed a lot. Um, number six, polystyrene is used in um, plastic cups, plastic, so plastic wine cups as well, not just the aerated polystyrene. Um, sorry, it's not styrofoam, like so, the packing pellets, but also uh, plastic wine glasses, plastic knives and forks, also um, set squares are polystyrene. Seven is everything else. So the main sevens that I would want to know: polyamide is um, Kevlar and nylon. ABS we talked about is Lego, uh, Rubik's cubes, shower heads, uh, 3D printers. Polycarbonate is headlights. It's um, very, uh, very, very hard, so it's scratch resistant. It's relatively tough um, and very clear. Whereas um, PMMA, which is acrylic, which is what we use in year seven to make our pencil box lids, is um, very workable and it's used in tail lights. PLA is also used in 3D printing, but it's biodegradable. So I think it's polylactic acid. The two th three thermosets we need to know, so silicone and um, neoprene being elastomers because they have that softness. Uh, silicone with an E, not silicon. Silicon is the metal. Silicone with an E is the polymer. Um, polyurethane is used in fake leather. 
and phenylformaldehyde is bakelite so um and also loose like melamine so like kitchen countertops um they're phenylformaldehyde okay so let's go back here so what we have here we have abs nylon polycarbonate this is a numbered one two and four it's so important it's such a huge polymer polyethylene is num numbered got two numbers the um pmma or acrylic um, polypropylene is number five. It's the, n the next one after polyethylene in terms of its importance. Um, Teflon is considered a polymer. I always forget that one. It's not something I will probably likely to test you on. And PVC is number three. Uh, this student has added in those extra numbers. Not the clearest of notes, but uh, I'll, I'll take it as a reminder over not having it at all. Okay, so we talked about thermoset. So here we can see that here we only have the, the weak London forces, the... Um, the van der Waals forces joining the weak secondary bonds. Here we have strong covalent bonds holding those monomers together. Okay, so we then talk about ceramics. So really in this book we don't talk too much about ceramics. It's worth noting that ceramics include a variety of things. I have um, some notes already on ceramics. So uh, stone, clay products, cement products, glass products, abrasives and electronics are the classifications. The one we were most interested in glasses and um, so I used the picture of April to uh, sorry um, Ariel to rem remember glasses I don't know why that's not responding and really I probably am not likely to go through too much of this in your test but um, by the end of the year this is something that I will will be testing you on in the exam at the end of year 11. So you need to know the most common glass is float glass. You, it would be worth knowing that toughened glass is used in um, passenger windows and laminated glass is used in um, windshields. The idea is that toughened glass, it's, um, when it crumbles, it goes into uh, safe sharps, uh, um, shape, small granular chunks rather than jagged shards. So it's used in glass doors, shower screens, passenger windows. Laminated glass is used in windshields, skylights, and storefronts. You can see this video here where we see the effect of um, tempered or toughened glass. Oh, come on. This should... Boom. That's standard glass. So it's big jagged shards that kill people. I have a scar. I have three stitches from where I uh, thought it was a good idea to open a window um, just by forcing it. Tempered glass, you can see, makes small, safe, granular sharp. And then the laminated glass, boom, you can't, you just can't break through it. Or you sort of got to take quite a few attempts. The last one you can see is right on the edge. Oh, no, no, I'll take it back. Okay, yeah, so it holds the chip for quite a while. Uh, okay, so... Th that's pretty much what I'll go about there. So, forming and shaping ceramics. Okay, so here we talk about, there is something called slip molding and different ways, like when I mean, we can talk about potter's wheels, how we make vases using a potter's wheel, like the movie Ghost, but it's not really something that I go into too much. We can talk about extruding bricks, but it's not something that you're likely to be tested on. By all means, read it. We're gonna go through it in more detail in chapter, in volume two, chapter two. So that's the year 12 class. Okay, so composites, finally go through the details of composites. You need to know um, timber and concrete are the main two. I will talk about um, fiberglass in a second. So fiberglass and carbon fiber. So timber is a composite, it's a natural composite. It's made of fibers and resin, the same as um, most fiber reinforced plastics. But so the fibers are made of cellulose and the resin is called linen. Um, you don't need to know those things, you just need to say it's fibers and resin, um, which is the case uh, for other things. Uh, timber has interesting properties. It's, it's um, easy to cut, easy to join. Uh, it's biodegradable. It's a form of carbon capture and storage, which means it's good for the environment in that regard. Um, it has very good strength to weight ratio. I think it's similar to steel in its strength to weight ratio, but um, uh, I, don't quote me on that. That um, it's that I, I think it's, it's good strength to weight. It says here very excellent specific strength strength to weight weight, weight ratio. Um, it does have problems that it um, biodegrades, so it means that it's not as durable. So, for instance, for bridges, it's eventually going to either burn or suffer from rot 
all the uh, or other things that mean that it's not good for structures that need to last hundreds of years um, and that the problem is that also it's a natural product so that it means that it can have defects it also can only grow to certain sizes which is why if I go to this picture here I have a picture of glue lamb where we just have pieces of timber that have been glued on top one on top of the other we also have LVL which is where we take thin sheets and we make um, our, our beams out of thin sheets all glued together the advantage of that is that it gets around having the natural defects if we have a knot hole it's much less of a problem because even where there's one knot hole the other in this case one two three four five six seven um, so the other six pieces uh, make up compensate for that um, and it also can be made to any length so it's the advantage of um, of these engineered timbers LVL and glue lamb uh, back to the book so timber we talk about concrete concrete is incredibly important um, engineering material it's made of cement plus aggregates which is um, sand and rocks uh, Aggregate sounds a lot better than sand and rocks. Uh, in Australia, we usually use basalt, but we can use um, we can use a variety of different uh, different materials. I think granite is, is also commonly used. Um, okay, the last one is fiber reinforced plastics, which include um, so fiberglass is uh, where we use glass fibers, and it's in a plastic in a polymer resin or in um, carbon fiber can be used. So in this case, it's carbon fiber reinforced um, polymer. So uh, it's pretty impressive that they can hold solid, sh solid shape. So if we look at this material here, it's in one big solid shape. It can um, be shaped into position and shaped into a variety of different shapes. Very, low, very lightweight, good, excellent corrosion resistance. Um, good strength to weight ratio, good fatigue strength, a whole bunch of other um, positive properties. Okay, so that is all of chapter one except for communication. So sketching, what we need to know is, um, we need to understand the difference between orthogonal drawings and pictorial drawings. So we need to know that in Australia, the top view is always drawn on top. Uh, so this is what this symbol represents, that this is what we use in Australia. We use first angle projection, not third angle projection. And we need to understand that with pictorial drawings that we can have, um, I'll go to the drawings here. So with pictorial drawings, we can have perspective drawings, which we don't use in, in engineering. That's more for architects. We use isometric and oblique. So perspective look the most natural. Isometric look a little bit less natural, but they are um, they're more accurate. We can measure off that drawing, and then oblique looks the least natural, but it's fairly easy to draw for simple shapes. When we get to, the problem with oblique is that um, oblique is great when we only have detail, like circles, for instance, in something that's hard to draw in one face. If we had to draw just one a shape with only one circle, that's easy to do. But when we have two circles, it's not so easy. Instead, we have um, we want to use isometric drawings. Now, I've gone into more detail on this previously, but the great thing about isometric drawings is we can buy isometric drawing templates. Um, hey, the Lego man. Oh, circle templates. There we go. So you can buy isometric drawing templates. So um, Eckersley has good ones. It is important that you get the right ones because um, it's a little bit of detail to go through and probably not worth it for this video, but there are good ones and not so good ones. But um, if you ask me in class, I will talk about that in more detail. Okay, so that is a pretty... Um, a pretty good high level summary of the things that we're going to do in this course. I'll just quickly um, I'll, I'll finish on drawings. I was about to wrap it up, but I remember I also need to talk about line types. So we need to be familiar with line types. So um, this is all specified by something called the AS 1100 drawing standards. If you look at the Victorian government, they have a good set of um, notes on how to 
do drawings and uh, I think that's definitely worth looking at. Um, okay, so this is a good high level uh, summary of everything we've done in this chapter and the things that you could be tested on. Hopefully here I've given a good indication of the things that I'm not, I don't think are too important. As much as I like Copeland, I think he does put stresses on some things which he might have to teach because of syllabus requirements, which really aren't all that relevant in um, the working context. So um, what I would like you to do, if you've gone through all that, the three focal areas that I wanted to talk about were mechanical properties, now it says material properties, but we're mostly interested in the mechanical properties. They're the ones that you should be familiar with. In particular, strength, hardness, and plasticity and elasticity. Um, I would say it's worthwhile to know things like the word tough, brittle, or um, durable. That's the first thing. The second thing I would suggest that you want to know about is you want to know about forming processes. So forming processes is casting, rolling, extruding, um, and welding. And then the third thing is polymers. So I guess at the high level, um, if you when you do the review questions, you'll see that there's um, additional polymerization, co um, condensation polymerization. We need to know about copolymers, which is when we have the A, B, A, B. We need to know about um, the difference between thermo softening and thermo setting, which is the difference between these cross links, which mean that the these ones don't soften, they just burn. Um, but it gives additional, str additional strength and durability. Um, we need to know a few different ones. I've talked about the ones that are worth knowing and you need to know an application for, I would say one example of each is probably a good, good, exam a good thing to know. Um, and then the stuff we've talked about with drawing. So for those things, then at the end of the chapter, there are chapter review questions. Now, what I have provided is for some of the chapter review questions, it can be a bit hard to actually find the answers. So what I have done is I have said, I've given you what page you can find the answer and just a few little points that might help you to understand the context a little bit better. So um, that's the, if you can answer every question here, you're probably gonna, you know, you should maybe feel a little bit more confident about um, going into the test. So uh, hopefully that helps and I will try and post this video now.